Let's go. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Jesus is alive. The Patriots are beat. And we shall mount up on wings as eagles and fly. Thanks for being here today. Super glad that you've chosen to worship with us here at COC. We are in the third week of a series that we have called Aliens. Um, we are talking uh, in this particular series about generosity and what God has to say about our time, our talents, and our treasures. Um, in short, about our money. Everybody can growl now. Just do it on the count of three. Uh, one, two, three. Oh, shame on you, man. It's a biblical subject and a spiritual subject, so God's going to speak directly to you today, whoever that was, um, about our money and our stuff. And we're kind of going about it in a different approach. So I am preaching today, this is the third week of the series, and I'm gone next week. Matt's speaking next week, so come back and hear him, all right, and wrapping up this series. My wife and I will be um, hopefully looking at the Sea of Galilee at this time next year or next week. We'll be in Israel, so we're very excited to go. And several folks from COC are joining us as well. It's like 160 total, not just from COC, but through Church of Celebration, Cornerstone, and Rock Point Church. Uh, all sister churches of ours are going over, about 165 of us. We're going to have a great time. Ginger's a little worried. She's like, did you see this? And posted something like Syria shot down an Israeli plane or whatever. And I'm like, babe, it's as old as the Bible. You know what I'm saying? It's always constant tension over there. And we could die at any minute, but we're going to have a good time because if we die, we're dying where Jesus walked. You know what I'm saying? So can I get an amen on that one, right? Nothing wrong with that. Like if you're going to go and you're like, if I had a choice to go somewhere, you know, right? You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are like, no, I don't want to die. Well, then you're going to have a problem talking about this series today because this series we've been all talking about here versus there and, and now versus then and uh, temporary versus eternal. And that's what it's all about. And that's kind of what we're doing in this. Uh, we talk about generosity every year at COC. And the reason we do that is I've shared this with you before. I believe money in, in specific, but generosity, your time, your talents, your treasures. Matter of fact, let's just say that so you understand that and kind of get acquainted. But when I say generosity, you just say time, talents, treasures. Ready? Generosity. Okay, left side. You suck. I mean, seriously, you got to get better over here, okay? Let's, let's pick this up, all right? Uh, on the count of three, I'm going to get in trouble because I just said you suck. My wife just looked at me, so that's all cool. But generosity on the count of three. One, two, three. Uh, louder. Generosity. 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 Okay, there you go. Somebody's excited. All right. I like that. Um, so here's the deal. We connect the dots with that. And, and um, the reality is, is we talk about this every, every year because I have said this before. I believe that, that, that money, our stuff, is, is seriously one of the most powerful subjects in all of Scripture. A spiritual truth, it's, it's, it's a faith journey that, that actually less go on than more go on. It's just a fact. And there's a reason why Jesus talks about it all the time. I've said this before. I'll always say this. I believe it's one of the top three most spiritual subjects in all of Scripture. And the problem is, is through the years when you've heard about money in the church, um, you've gotten bothered by it because people talk about it and, and it kind of like they, you feel like they're wanting your money. And, and nothing could be farther from the truth. I talk about this because I don't care about your money. You ever heard a pastor say that? before? I really don't. I care about your spiritual well-being and your walk with Jesus Christ. And I get this, that if you don't get it right with your money, you ain't going to get it right with God. And that's the most important thing to me than, than anything else. But that's why we, we share this with you. It's a big deal. So if you missed any of the previous weeks, you can go back, check it out online. Um, you can either listen to it or watch it. I've been told that I'm fun to watch on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. I appreciate that. Um, anyways, you can watch it online um, or you can listen to it and catch up. But I'll, I'll give you a quick debrief just so you, you get where we've been coming from. 
and you understand today if this is your first time with us. And by the way, if this is your first time, thanks so much. Welcome to coming to church. We're talking about money today. Isn't that fun? Yeah, you're like, great. All right. Um, but if you are a guest of ours today, if you haven't heard it already, please take the time to fill out a communication card. We want to know that you were here. Um, we want to make money off of you and sell that to Sprint and AT&T and everything of that <laughs> Joke's getting old. I'll stop that one. But we do want to know. Drop it off at any one of the bins at the doors, the big tent outside that says new here, start here. Got a small gift for you. We would like to give that to you. But thank you for coming. Um, and uh, we appreciate that. But here's where we started the conversation to bring you up to speed. That very first week we told you scripture tells us that as we are tempted to go into our world and into our culture and today more than ever look around us and start saying, man, it's getting really really weird in our culture. Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, it's getting stranger, just crazy. I mean, what is happening? Scripture actually tells us, believe it or not, culture and the world is not as crazy, strange, and weird as you think. Believe it or not, the culture and the world that we live in today and will continue to live in and probably continue to go that direction, it's actually normal. It's actually normal. And reality is, is when you're tempted to look at the culture and say those types of things, you need to probably stop just for a moment, think about it, and help you realize this, that you are actually the weird one. Yeah, it's like finally someone recognizes my strengths. Um, you are actually the weird one. As a believer in Jesus, we shared this in the very first week, you are an alien. You are only here on temporary assignment. This world is not your home. So you are supposed to live in such a way in which you are living for there instead of here. Now, to, to back that up a little bit, the, the Bible tells us this. All right, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? A new what? A new what? Which means old things, the, the old way of life that you used to live that that weird way that you think is weird today, that actually the world is normal, all of those things, they're, they're gone. But today, now in this new creation, you, all things have become new because you're a new creature. You're a new creature, which basically means this, if this is kind of hard to fill in the blanks, when you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, if you're a brother or sister in Christ, like I am, you're a born again believer. When you made the decision to follow Jesus, everything changed about you. Everything changed in your life. And we're not talking about a, a change of behavior or just a change of priorities. When you decided to say, yes, sign me up, I'm following Jesus. God literally now lives inside of you in the form of the person of the Holy Spirit, which means Get this, it's crazy, but you can't take God in and stay the same anymore. It is physically and spiritually impossible, which means that when there's tension in your life and things aren't always going well, it means you're probably not listening to the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you're still wanting to live the normal way, but you're not called to be normal, you're called to be abnormal. And now, this is not home. You are on temporary assignment with temporary things that you still need to accomplish while you're here. And when that happened, that, that moment you became a new creature, everything changed. And we share with you in that first week that if you keep living, if you keep living for this world, for what you think is normal, but it's not, and you don't embrace at some point in time this alien mindset. If you keep living your life, your tiny little dinky dot of a life on the timeline of eternity, you keep living that normal, you're gonna end up at the end of your dot extremely disappointed. 
extremely heartbroken, thinking, really? That wasn't all about me? You're called to live differently. You're called to live like an alien whose home is not here and your home is there. So with that idea, we rolled into last week and we gave you another type of crazy, strange, weird, alien concept that sounded something like this. As believers in Jesus, you're an alien. And if you're an alien, then you need to realize that you're not an owner, you're actually a manager. Which basically means if you're investing everything that you have, all your time, talents, and treasures in the here, then, then, then friends, you, you are blowing it because you're only renting stuff here. What you think you own is really on loan and you're just a renter. And if you keep living your life like an owner, then you're gonna miss it. You need to start living your life like a manager. I said this before and I shared it in the last service and I always say I've done hundreds of funerals and I've never gone to a funeral where there is a U-Haul following the hearse. Never in my life, never in my life have I gone to the gravesite. And I've done this right next to the, you know, six, eight foot hole in the ground right here where they're gonna put the casket in and right next to it is like this big, huge, ditch digger came along and built like this pool sized, right? This pool sized hole to where all of your, your house, your cars, every, your campers, your boats, everything's going. I've never, never done a funeral. And I've done funerals for believers and unbelievers to where everything goes in there. You know who gets it when you die? First, your kids and they're ungrateful bunch of you know what's, right? <laughs> First, they're gonna get it. And you're like, well, what am I doing, man? I don't. That's why we're talking about this. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're not an owner, you're a manager. And everything that you do with your time, talents, and treasures needs to be thinking and centered around managing, not owning. Because we said this last week, that God entrusted you. He has entrusted you with something to be able to make eternal impact or eternal significance. Your investments matter. And I even suggested last week that maybe just maybe if you're in a financial, if you're a believer in Jesus and you're in a financial position that's always, always seems to be tight, fill in the blanks, right? When someone borrows something from you and they return it and it's in bad shape, what are you gonna do the next time that they ask to borrow something? No because you're mismanaging what God has entrusted you with. And you gotta think that way and along those lines. So today, I wanna continue that type of thinking once again with introducing another strange, another weird, another crazy alien concept today. Now, I wanna take our conversation in the direction of uh, a bit more awkwardness and touchiness, okay? Um, and I wanna start talking today about uh, talking uh, about this alien conversation. And I wanna start talking about how it applies with your money. I mean, specifically with your money. Now, listen, when I say that, some of you are already really mad at me. And I love you, but I don't care, okay? I'm gonna tell you the truth. I'm gonna tell you exactly what the Bible has to say. And then I'm gonna let you figure that out and sort that out with God. But I want you to hear clearly what the word of God has to say about your money in particular. Now, I get why you're that way though, because I, I did say earlier that I've been in church all my life and I've been in churches where when they talked about money, you felt guilty because you didn't give. That is not the application and that is not what we're after. Because I will always say, like I've already said, I don't care about your money. No pastor will ever preach about money and tell you that. I don't, and you'll, you'll understand why. I, under, I care about your, your spiritual walk with Christ. And that's what I'm after, and you need to get that. So um, you may not be ready for this conversation today, and you're gonna be mad, and you'll be like, I wish I would've never came to church today, but you're still gonna hear everything, because if you got up and tried to walk out, 
We've got snipers with dart guns up in the rafters that you don't know about. And then you'll be the one that's everybody looking at instead of me. So um, maybe, just maybe, like I said, that you'll just lean this direction. Maybe you'll hear something today that you haven't ever heard before in a way that you, you'll just be like, wow, I've never thought about that. But some people are ready for the conversation. You've been leaning every year that we talk about it, every year that we have generosity, everywhere that we focus on on a week. You've been leaning more and more closer to hearing what God wants you to do. And and I'm hoping that maybe today is your day. But if you are mad and miffed at me right now, would you just do me a favor? Before you write it off, would you just consider it? And maybe, just maybe, what God has to say is, a big deal in my life. And, and be careful that you don't do what I call people doing a lot when we do talk about money and they just like, they, they pull a cane attitude. All right, they pull a cane tude. Cane tude, we'll just call it that today, shall we? They pull a cane attitude. Now, I'm gonna explain that in a minute, but, but what you're, you're like, what is a cane attitude? Have you ever gotten onto your children and they do this, this stuff right there, you know, and they just have that little attitude of like, I don't care what you say, I'm thinking something that I can't say out loud because I'd get in more trouble than I am now if I said it out loud. Do you know what I'm saying? Your kids, that look, this is what we're talking about. A lot of people get this way. A lot of people pull a cane attitude when we talk about money. We've said it, people get funny when we talk about money, but they do this. Now, Here's what pulling a cane attitude means. Anybody remember the story about Cain and Abel in the Bible? Raise your hand up high. Raise your hand up. Some people have not raised their hands, so they look, look around at them. They're the ones that are mad that I'm talking about money today. So, Because um, if you're as old as time, you've probably heard about Cain and Abel, right? It's the second story in the entire Bible. And, and it's about, literally, it's about two guys and their stuff. It, it just is. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. If you've got your Bible apps, you can turn there as well. Also, it'll be on the screens. And if you have problems finding Genesis today, we're in serious trouble. We're in serious trouble. Genesis chapter 2. The second story in the Bible. Actually, Genesis chapter 4, my bad. Genesis chapter 4. Um, here's what it says. In Genesis 4, 1 through 7, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother. Then it says, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked soil. So some time has passed in this period of of passage, and, and now we know what their jobs are. Abel worked as a shepherd, and Cain worked as a farmer. And then in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from the sum of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked on favor, or with favor on Abel and his offering, but Cain, on his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain became really angry, really mad, and his face was downcast. You ever had that happen with somebody? Like they're just in a bad mood and their face is showing it. And, 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 and you got a problem. Like, what's your problem? Nothing's wrong with me. What's your problem? I said, well, tell your face something. You know, you, tell your face that. So this is what's going on. He's mad because God has not accepted his offering. And he's bothered by this because sibling rivalry? What, what's going on here? So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why, why is your face so downcast? What, why are you upset at me? Cain, what is the problem here? Why so bitter, big boy? And, he, you know, God knows this stuff, right? Maybe you've had this conversation with him as well. So then God proceeds to teach him a lesson because he knows this is a problem about heart. And he says, listen, Cain, this is not that hard. If you do what is right, if you obey me, Will you not be accepted? Come on. But if you do not what is right, don't don't miss this. If you don't obey me, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. And it will stay at your door and it will always desire to have you. 
If you can't master this, if you can't get control of this, come to terms with what I've called you to do and be obedient, Cain. Follow my ways, not your ways. If you can't do that, you need to understand it's going to someday control you, enslave you. Now, if you're like me from the first time that you ever heard this story, it sounded something like this, right? Cain and Abel, they're brothers. Abel sacrifices things that God likes, meat, firstborn. Cain sacrifices what God doesn't like, fruits, veggies. God's not a vegetarian. He likes bacon. You know what I'm saying? So, and I've also heard this through the years that many people have taught that, that they believe why Cain brought, uh, why Cain brought these sacrifices uh, and the reason that God wouldn't accept them is because somehow it was like diminishing the death of Jesus on the cross. And when I've heard those arguments, I've stopped and said, okay, could you please show me in my Bible where it says that? I don't, I don't get that, right? And, and a lot of people try to draw the you know, big spiritual conclusions on that stuff because actually I believe this story is not even pertaining to a particular sacrifice. Uh, that particular sacrifice, because the sacrifice of Jesus hadn't even taken place yet. We're still like in the second story of the Bible. Matter of fact, it had nothing to do with any particular form of sacrifice. It was actually, it was actually dealing with a giving moment. So I guess you could say that giving to God, generosity, time, talents, and treasures, it's his oldest time. <laughs> that, that's a good one. I just came up with that right there, so... And in particular, in specific, it was dealing with this particular giving idea. The first fruits. The first fruits. And that's what we want to talk about. What does the first fruits mean, Josh? Basically, it means your very best. Your very best. So here's my question out of the gate for this story. Why do you think God rejects Cain's offering and accepts Abel. So I'm going to give you a little insight and unpack this for you, and then we'll walk through the rest. The Bible says, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. That was their jobs. That was their workplace. Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Now catch attention to the next phrase. It says, in the course of time, you work your job. Whatever your job is, and this is kind of where the hang-up is today for a lot of believers in Jesus, in the course of time, what does that mean in the 21st century? Uh, in the course of a month, after some time has set in, after you've paid all the bills, after you've accumulated some debt because you bought some things that you needed to have, and you thought you needed to have, but you didn't have the money to have. After he had built up some resentment and jealousy in the course of time, and here it is, ready? Here it is, big idea. In the course of time, over a period of time, finally, Cain brought some. Some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And our key word that most believers in Jesus struggle with today with this whole tithing and first fruits concept, this is the word, some, some. You know what some means, right? Some means whatever's left, the leftovers, the leftover parts. So my suggestion with this story out of the gate, just to kind of set the table is this. Maybe, just maybe, this story wasn't about what was given. Maybe, just maybe, this story's about how it was given. And maybe, just maybe, if that's the case, because this is a generosity, a stuff story, maybe, just maybe, the problem you may be in financially or the struggles that you may be facing with your life, wherever it may be, is not about what 
you're giving. It's about how you're giving. Because after all, right, and, and, and I talked to someone briefly on their way out, and they said, you know, I started this whole tithing thing, but, but right out of the gate, it just didn't change until I became a happy giver. And I'm like, huh, yeah, maybe that's why Jesus said that he loves a cheerful giver. Somebody that wants to do that because that's how we're supposed to get. So it's kind of the, this equation. And that's what we want to dive deeper into today because the very thing that Cain missed and he pulls an attitude with may be the very thing that you might be missing in your life too. And it deals with first fruits. Turn your Bible apps to Exodus chapter 23. Very next book in the Bible, go to your right, the very next one, Genesis, Exodus. And this is what I want to show you today about first fruits so you understand. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, it tells us this. Bring the, what's the next word? That was absolutely horrendous. That, it wasn't your best, thank you very much. Bring the, best. bring the, best. bring the, best. of the, of the, no, don't, don't, don't do the fruit thing, okay? Let's just work on this. We'll work on this together, the first, okay? Bring the, yes. of the, first. bring the, yes. of the, first. bring the, best. of the, first. there we go. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to where? The house of the Lord your God. Now, here's what you got to get with this passage this morning, okay? And understand the time frame that it was written, and then we'll connect the dots to where it is today. This is what God was saying with this particular passage, okay? He was saying to the farmer, look, you're going to bring me, this is, this is your sacrifices, this is what I'm asking you to do, all right? You're going to bring me the first 10% of your crops, Okay? And you're not going to bring me the crops, you know, in the portion of the fields where it just didn't get much water. No, 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 no. We're not going to the back 40 to get those crops, okay? You're going to go to the most plush, nourished, overabundant area of the fields, and you're going to take 10% of that area, and you're going to bring that best area, that best 10% to me, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to put it on the altar, right on top of the altar, the best, the first and the best, and you're going to put it on the altar, and then guess what? This is the coolest part. We're going to take a match, which they probably didn't have matches back then, so you know, figure out rock stuff, whatever, okay? And then we're going to light it up, and we're going to burn it up. We're going we're gonna to take your first and your best and we're going to burn it up. Because I want your first, I want your best. That is your sacrifice to the Lord. That's what we're going to do. And to the farmer who is a caretaker of livestock, he said, here's what I want you to do, okay? You're going to bring me the first born of your livestock. All right, we're not talking about Bessie because she's been a good milking cow and her time's up. All right, we're, we're not talking, you know, about the older sheep that can't even give birth anymore. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to your cows, you're going to go to your sheep, and you're going to go to those ones that have not yet given birth. And when they give birth to their very firstborn, the very best... That's the top tier. That's the 10%. You're going to take that and you're going to bring that very firstborn You're going to take that firstborn lamb and you're going to lay it on top of the sacrificial table and you are going the very first one, and you're going to burn it up. That's what you're going to do. 
How cool is that? We're going to burn your best because that's what you're doing in understanding the first and best first fruits principle. It's mine. It's not yours. Remember, you're not an owner. You're a manager. And you're just giving back to me what is mine. And here's the cool part. I'm only asking for 10%. That's it. And we're going to burn it up. Now, time out real quick, okay? I know that this is kind of a hard concept to grasp because that was that day and age. Now, some of us might not have a problem laying our firstborn on the altar of sacrifice today. Can I get an amen on that one, right? All right, but don't, don't, don't do that today, okay? Um, here's the cool part about the New Testament grace age in which we live. The coolest part is this. God still asks for your first and your best, your first fruits. But the coolest part, because he's, he's, his amount of grace just continues to amaze me and it continues to grow and grow and grow. We don't actually burn our best anymore. Your 10% that you would choose to give to the house of the Lord, to the church in which you, you are at, you actually, this is the coolest part, isn't it? You actually get to see your best to use. Look up. There's lights on today, isn't it? Your first and your best paid for those lights to be on. Your first and best pays for an incredible building that we get to meet in every week. Your first and best goes into the investment of salaries for staff members so they can do full-time ministry work and get involved in people's lives and serve them. Your first and best gets to plant churches all across the valley through Vision Arizona. Your first and best gets to start and help other church plants throughout the country, like our sister church, COC Texas, Metro. Your first and best gets to be sent over to India where we get to build lepers' homes, where we get to feed orphans for a year. Your first and best, you get to see where your first and best goes. I mean, if you, if you ever, most people are like, I don't want to do it because I don't know where they spend it and all that stuff and whatever. You know, you, you're like, it's mine. You, you, Gollum. Precious. Some of you, Lord of Rings, a little outdated. But you, you, you want you want to see where your money goes. And God's like, hey, you know what? It's really not about that, but I'll show you where it does. It's actually really about you just give to me and not worry about anything else. But do you know what the biggest lesson in this whole idea that's applicable to them as well as us, which, which is huge? This concept right here of tithing, of first fruits, of giving God our first and our best, that concept is not about God needing your money. I am so tired of this argument. I, I, I get it. I know that there's previous churches you grew up in and they mismanaged money and everything along the way. And, and just so you know, we're, we're not above that. But for, for 11 and a half years, we pretty, we've had a pretty good track record going so far. 1,500 people have grown, have come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior since our inception. There's over 1,200 people that call COC. Again, we're not above that, but there is a series of accountabilities in line. That is not why. I hate this conversation more than anything, because this is like the top of the list for somebody that's struggling with this first and best thing. Like, God, this is just God needing my money. God does not need your money. He owns a, th a cattle on a thousand hills. God, we don't need your money. I've said this. Listen. If God needed your money and he needed their money in the beginning, then why would he have burned it up? You know what this idea is about and the hiccup that you may have with it is about? God doesn't need your money. He just needs you and me to know something else. You don't need your money to be your God. That's the bigger idea about this whole first fruits thing. It's not about you giving to the church, you giving to the church. The whole idea, this is it. I'm, I'm letting you in on my secret why we talk about this every year. 
It's not about God, it's not about us needing your money. It's about you needing to know that your money doesn't need to be your God. That's what this whole idea is about. So let me share with you two really important truths today that you need to get. If you haven't gotten there yet, take a step further. Two important thoughts about this idea of first fruits and tithing, just so you get this. All right, number one, if you're a note taker, when you and I give to God our first and our best, our first fruits, our first 10%, and I can already hear the pushback. Do you mean gross or net? Do I need to go back to where God said the field, right? Not the back 40, not old Bessie. So just to clear that matter up, I'm thinking gross is what you totally make. That is totally what God gives to you. So let's just kind of end it on that argument. And now many of you are really now mad, seriously, and you shut me off and that's cool. I don't care. So listen, when you and I give God our first fruits, our best, our first 10%, we are shouting at the top of our lungs this, I love you, God. When we give our first and best without any reservation, without any hesitation, we are screaming to God first and foremost and to anybody else around, your children who are always watching, you are screaming, God, Money is not my God, you are my God. I love you and only you, God. That is what you're screaming when you get this idea. I knew this message would be you know, met with mixed reactions, so I'm not expecting big applause, that's cool. God, I'm giving you my first, my best, and here's why, God. Because I love you more, listen, listen, I love you more, God, than anything that this could buy me. God, I love you more than anything else that this could provide me with. God, when you look at my priorities, you're at the top, and there ain't nothing even close in comparison. I love you more than anything that that stuff could buy me. You know why that's the case? Because God knows this. He knows that your heart and my heart are intrinsically connected to our money. It is, it is like a Chinese finger trap. I, they are connected. They are constantly being drawn to one another. What do you mean? You've heard, the, this is in every generosity series, whichever church you ever go to, but Matthew chapter six, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What does that mean? Your heart is intrinsically connected and will always be pulled by your money and your stuff. God says, this is, this is like a war that is as old as time. It will always be an ongoing battle. That passage even goes on and says, you cannot. It is physically and spiritually impossible to serve God and money. It's one or the other. And scripture, guys, scripture is loaded. It's loaded with powerful teaching on money. Two thirds, two thirds of all the parables that Jesus spoke, and you might be out there and you may be wondering, what is a parable? It's the children's version story that Jesus broke down powerful spiritual truth because it was just so far over their head and it's so far over your head. So Jesus said, let me put this in a children's story for you. Two thirds of those lessons, of those teachings, that Jesus himself spoke, two thirds of the spiritual applications that Jesus spoke, guess what? They were about money and possessions. And that's not all. 
One in 10 verses in the Gospels. What are the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is where we go to see about and read about the life of Jesus. One out of every 10 verses. That's interesting, isn't it? That's 10%. One out of every 10 ver uh, verses in the Gospels deal with money and stuff. And if you read this whole book, take the time to read this whole book, right? There is more than 2,300 verses that talk specifically and directly about money. So to put that in perspective, let's do this, ready? That's five more times than the Bible talks about prayer. That's five more times than the Bible talks about faith. Coincidence? Do you think that God thought that Jesus communicated, this might be a problem? It's not about the church or Jesus needing your money. It's about idolatry. It's about false gods. Matter of fact, because it's such a big deal and I've dealt with it personally earlier in my life, still have some moments at times that I'm just tempted with certain things, but I've dealt with enough people in counseling, I've equated it this way. I think money is like a mistress that you have had an affair on that keeps coming back to you and whispering in your ear, come on, one more time. Show me that you love me more than you love You may be out there and you can challenge us, right? You're like, Josh, that's cute and all. But come on, man. I don't love my money. The way I view my money is it's a necessity, right? I have to have it to live. But come on, look at my area, look at my budget. I don't love my money. And if you are, if you're that confident in that, can I just challenge you with something? If you don't love your money, then why don't you tithe 25%? And now you're really bothered by that. Like, dude, just back off. You're really coming at me really hard this morning. Do you know why you're bothered by the fact that I said, if you don't love your money, then don't for, screw 10%. That should be the floor. Right? Seriously, I've shared this so many. That should be the floor, guys. That was an Old Testament principle and practice that was being taught. And you're like, yes, sir, we live in the grace age. We don't have to tithe 10%. Are you, okay, let's not have that argument today, all right? I've talked to you. Because if you believe in that, then why don't you just take this book and rip out everything in the Old Testament because it's not practical to you today. When Jesus came, Jesus fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. And then you know what he did? He raised the standard. He took it to a whole nother level. And he said, 10%, are you kidding me? No, 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 no. That, and, 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 and you know what's really cool is Jesus actually, we, we, we read about it here today in the 21st century. We're 21st century, right? Not 22nd. 21st century, right? We read about it, and now we know the end of the story. The early people in the New Testament age, they didn't even know the, 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 the end of the story. But we know that Jesus died for our sins. And he rose again, and he's coming back. We know this. So 10%? Are you kidding me? Screw that. That should be the floor. You're living in a world with truth and knowledge of what Jesus did for you. There should be no limit on your giving. heart is intrinsically connected 
to your money. But when you give God your first and your best, you're just screaming, I love you more, God. I love you more than anything that could buy me. It's yours. Here's the second concept. If and when you can move closer or even take that step over to fully just obey this principle of first fruits, ready? When you and I give God our first fruits, our best, our first and our best, when we move towards tithing our first 10%, it involves, here's what I know, here's what I know. It involves an incredible amount of faith. Probably, if you're not there yet, a faith level in which you've never reached before. And now if you've reached it and you're like, whoo, thank Jesus, I'm tithing 10%. You ain't arrived yet either because you ain't got the idea or concept of offering yet, which is above and beyond. See, you're never, you get that? You, you never actually arrive when it comes to giving to God. There's always a next step that you can take. But it involves, I know this for a fact, it involves an incredible amount of faith. Ginger and I have gone there so many times and which is like, I think we should do this, I don't know, but it's this, that, whatever. And it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Here's why, if I give God my first and my best, I am gonna have to do something that I've really struggled or never done. I'm gonna have to trust God to make up what I'm actually giving to Him. Huh? What? In practical terms, it means this, after adding up all my bills, after figuring out my budget, after paying off the debt that has me enslaved to it, and I've accumulated all that stuff that I wanted that I didn't necessarily need, at the end of all of it, we figure it out and we say, I just don't know how I could give God 10%. I, this, huh? I don't know. Well, first and foremost, stop. Stop thinking kingdom mathematics. Your brain is not big enough to figure it out. And I don't know how else to tell you this because it's just like weird. Because when you figure it that way, first of all, God's not a bill. Okay? But I guess that probably resolved a little bit of that. If you keep viewing him like a bill, it's not going to work out. It's gonna require a faith level that you've never reached before. Never in your life. Let me explain that. It means that you're gonna to have to believe in the substance that God is going to provide back what you gave to him and you're gonna to have to hope for it. I'm hoping he's actually gonna substantially provide that back. And you're gonna to have to believe in an evidence that you just can't see. I can't see how this is working, so I'm going to believe that God is going to evidentially make this happen somehow that I just can't figure out and calculate. And he's gonna provide back to me what I have given to him. Do you realize, friends, how much faith that is? Let me give it to you in tangible terms. This is how much faith that requires. In my lifetime in ministry, there are very few that have reached this faith level. Matter of fact, just to give it to you even more specifically, there's only a handful, just a handful of people in this church, this very church that have reached that faith level. Let me explain it to you, it makes sense. We're a church that has over 1,200 people total that say, I'm a celebrator. Are you a celebrator? Say amen. Okay. Over 1,200 people. Last year, 2017, 50 family units of that 1,200, 50 family units. So that's kind of in the realm of 150 to 200 total people out of 1,200, including kids, that 150 to 200, gave 57.5% of our total giving last year, which was $890,795. $820,795, which means 150 to 200, which we really know we could eliminate some kids from that, but 50 total family units gave 57.5% of our total giving last year. Let's round that off and say that's 500,000. 
150 to 200 people out of 1,200 gave 500,000 total dollars to the total giving of our church last year. So on the flip side, that means 42.5% of our giving, the other 325,000 and change was given by a thousand to by about a thousand other people that, that, that are celebrators. Which tells me, when I read these principles and I understand what the scripture says, it tells me this. It just tells me that there's about a thousand people who say, yes, I'm on board, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I go to COC, I'm a celebrator. There's about a thousand people that have yet to reach a faith level that God wants them to reach. Now listen, before you read me wrong, I ain't mad. I ain't even bothered by this. Because here's what that happens to me when I see these figures. I start thinking this, can you just imagine with me for a minute? Can you just imagine what we might actually be able to accomplish for the kingdom as a church if a thousand more people that only gave 42.5% of our total giving last year gave to their full capacity, they gave their first and their best. And can you imagine what we might be able to accomplish for the kingdom if a thousand more people went one more step in their faith journey? Woo! Talk about, we could buy half of Maricopa, let alone 15 acres. I'm not mad, I'm not discouraged. When I look at this stat, I'm not trying to offend anybody today, I'm not. And if you're offended, then you got a problem with God, not me, okay? I'm actually encouraged at the possibilities for somebody here today to go to another level of faith in which you have never experienced before. Because I don't care about your money. And God don't care about your money. He cares about your faith. It is not what God wants from you. Stop thinking that. That's how an owner thinks. That is not an alien way to think. It is about what God wants for you. It is about what God wants for you. in the course of time. After I figured all of this out and it just didn't seem to, all right, this just doesn't make sense. So I can't figure this. So this is all I have left. In the course of time, Cain brought some. Telling you, friends, that story, the second story in the Bible, it's not about what Cain gave. It's about how Cain gave. And maybe, just maybe, the question for you today is this with your first fruits conflict, it's not about what you're giving, it's about how you're giving. Listen, here's all I know. God asks for your first and for your best. I know that is a specific fact from the word of God. So here's what that means, friends, just so you can put this in perspective and kind of get the bigger picture. When God asks, okay, when God asks, you get out of the boat and you walk on water. When God asks, you march around a city seven times and let the finger of God push the walls over. When God asks, you charge a giant and you defeat him. When God asks, you enter a fiery furnace and walk out not smelling like barbecue. When God asks, you leave your familiar land behind and you birth a nation. When God asks, you get betrayed by your family, sold into slavery, do a stint at county, but later come back and rule over them. When God asks, you do what God asks you to do period, and then sit back and marvel and wonder in awe about how God provides for you. Amen. 
Let me close this with an illustration. All right? And let me give you um, my testimony. I've called a lot of people up here during this series and had them help me. But this is kind of like that, not the message that you want to ask somebody to come up and say, hey, would you mind coming up and sharing about how you're not tithing? It probably wouldn't work out very well. So um, I'll share my story. I've shared this before, just different ways, but I'll, I'll share this, my story, so you I'll leave me um, out hanging to dry. Um, when Ginger and I got married 23 years ago, 24 this coming June, 17th. <laughs> My mom and dad were incredibly generous. They gave us our honeymoon. Um, and Ginger's mom and dad said, we'll offer you something. You can make a choice. So they said, we will, we will either give you your dream big Blow out wedding, Ginger, or we'll take the money that we would have, that we've saved for that and would have spent on that and give that money to you as a down payment on a brand new house. Wow. Are you kidding me? Of course, Ginger and I jumped at the American dream. And we went all over that like nobody's business. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but here's the problem. <laughs> the problem was... Um, I didn't know this at the time. I'm pretty sure Ginger didn't either. But a down payment doesn't buy a house. Did you know that? <laughs> For some reason, I guess there's, they want you to keep paying money on it. <laughs> and they charge you interest on it at that. You know what I'm saying? Anybody here ever heard of a mortgage? Isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your life? So... Needless to say, brand new married, I left straight from like my mom and dad's house because I was the best of the four children. They loved me the most. They let me stay there the longer, longest. But literally they were laughing, throwing plates on the ground, breaking them as I left like, they're gone, they're gone. So I went straight from there to kind of like, you know, full maid service, full, full fridge, all that kind of stuff free laundry, all that stuff, right into marriage. And, uh, um, but things got tough and they got tight fast. Let me explain why and how they got tough and tight. First and foremost, Ginger and I, brand new married, we figured out that the bank wants money every month. Once again, stupid idea, mortgage, I don't get it. Um, so we had to pay this thing and Ginger, um, Ginger and I were both going to school full-time. She went to Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. I went to Baptist Bible College, I was in Bible College at the time. Um, I was taking 18 hours of school. She was taking 18 hours of school. We both worked at MCI, which was telemarketing. I loved it and I was great at it, right? Because listen, I, I, I'm a seller. I sell Jesus every week to you. Some of you people still ain't buying it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you, the price ain't gonna change and it's a perfect price. You need to buy Jesus, okay? But I'm selling him and I, did, I committed my life to selling Jesus. Ginger, on the other hand, man, most empathetic person in the world, caring soul. She loves the broken, the hurting, everything like that. So one phone call where I could shut the door in like, you know, 10 minutes with somebody I knew I could take advantage of, it would take her 45 minutes to an hour and a half and we only worked four hours a night. She hated it. I came home one day, she was weeping and crying and I'm like, baby, I do the world for you, quit your job. I'll work 18 hours, or you know, I'll go to school 18 hours and then I'll go work at Jiffy Lube. I was an assistant manager at Jiffy Lube where I worked 40 to 50 hours a week as well as then at nighttime went and, and worked at MCI. Needless to say, I didn't sleep for like four years. But things got tough and they get tight because I lost somewhat of an income even though she didn't make commission because she couldn't sell crap. Um, <laughs> she got paid hourly. But here's what I didn't know. Things started accumulating and we had to, we, listen, we still had to have the necessities of life, right? You will know what I'm talking about, but again, this is me. We had to have the necessities of life. We were just brand new married, so we, we had to, we had to still go on dates, correct? 
So we spent some money on some dates. We had to go on dates because you got to keep the romance alive. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm talking about. Okay. My dad would still call and say, hey, you want to go golf? And I have to golf. Come on, are you kidding me? I had no free time in the world. So anytime I had free time, you know, if Ginger was busy, then I'm going golfing. And I had to buy the latest and greatest equipment. So I, I had to get that. Um, we lived on the south side, which is the cool side in Springfield. Ginger lived on the north. I married her and saved her from a life of poverty and um, brought her. But our schools were still on the, on the north side, so we had to drive it. It's so the necessities, right? You do have to put gas in your cars. And every once in a while, Ginger, of course, would like to go shopping with her mom, or my mom would call me, yeah, baby, I, baby, I can take care of you, give you a little cash, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Here's a credit card, right? And then, of course, I needed to get a jump start on my weight problem. So I had to make sure that I, I ate my king size Snickers and um, king size Mountain Dew every day on my way to school and to work probably four or five times a day. And to get a. Right? So come on, first and best not going to work. And then that's not even the big stuff, right? Right? Mortgage. Once again, stupid idea, but you have to pay the mortgage. It has to be done. And then I didn't know this either, but electricity and water aren't free. Utilities, right? And, and, and I had to pay the utilities that, that had to be done. It had to be done on a regular basis, the utilities thing, and, and that was absolutely stupid. And then this one seemed to be the biggest because for some reason, I believe that when someone said, hey, congratulations, we're going to loan you $15,000 to transfer your budget, you know, or your, your credit card debt. So credit card debt went out of control, you know what I'm saying? So we had, that was like monstrous. So at the end of the day, when it came to this first fruits thing, it was kind of like, this just doesn't make sense. There's, there's no room for it, God. Because th this is my, you know, you know my life, there's no room for it. And this got out of control, friends. Out of control. I told you, at one point in time, I think we probably had like 50 some thousand plus dollars in credit card debt. It was insane or more. So Ginger and I had a long talk, and I said, Ginger, the bills aren't adding up. This is not working. I think the way that you and I are choosing to do it just isn't the right way. And she had no clue. You'd think she'd have the time to pay the bills, but she didn't even do that. Um, <laughs> Now, seriously, shh, be quiet. This is about you people, shh. You're just trying to get out of this because you rid yourself of your guilty conscience. So I said, Ginge, we got to make a change. I think we need to do some things differently. My mom and dad, her mom and dad had always modeled this. They'd always taught this, but you know, you just kind of learn. And so some of you know this, you're not, not to mention the amount of stress that it caused on a brand new marriage. It's amazing. It's miraculous that we even made it through those first three years. Because that strain, that stress, that stuff that we were enslaved to led to so many different other things. It literally is, for those of you that your, your, your finances are out of freaking control and you're married, I, it's, it's, I can't think of a harder thing to overcome. I mean, it's, sometimes people talk about like an affair or, 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 and it's up there. Sexual immorality is up there, but I'm telling you with counseling that I've done, money gives it a rival. Debt gives it a really good fight. So I said, Ginge, we, we ought to consider maybe doing it God's way. 
giving him the first and the best. I can't figure it out. I don't know how it's gonna work, but here's what I'm gonna do. The very first check that I write at every month, I'm gonna make it out to High Street Baptist Church. And God, that's because I love you more than anything else that I could buy with that extra. And God, and I wanna go to another level of faith with you. I wanna see you do things like, I can't figure this out in the budget, so I wanna see you do it. I wanna sit back and marvel at you. So we decided, and it was hard. We said, we're gonna, we're gonna do God first. We're gonna tie 10%. He's gonna get our first and our best. Stupid mortgage is gonna get that other part. We'll pay for that house. Credit card debt, we better start tackling that now. We better get after it. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that now. And then, um, you know what I'm saying? This is kind of cool, but we'll, 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 we'll do what we have to do with utilities and, and we'll, we have to pay that. And then Ginge, we'll just, we'll, we'll trust God. We'll trust God. So time went by and baby girl wanted to go shopping with her mama. So sure, I got a little extra cash. It's crazy, but you can have some. And, uh, and then of course, you know, dad would call and I have a, finally have, you know, a day off. So yeah, let's go golfing. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't pay for me, I don't know why. It's like something about you're out of the house, you're gone, you know? And then gas in the car just seemed like every other day, right? You know, you got teenagers, hey, can I get 20 bucks for you? You know what I'm saying? But it, you know what it's like. So we paid a little bit of that. And then as I, as I said before, I was very committed about my weight problem later on in life. So I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything that I could to get ahead and a jump start on that. So. There was quite a few of Snickers and King Size, you know, Mountain Dews and frozen little Debbie snack cakes and Ginger's homemade Snicker doodle cookies and Domino's and Pizza Hut and everything of that case. And for some reason, every month, it just seemed to be like we had everything we needed. I don't know how you're gonna do it, God. I have no clue, it doesn't make sense to me. But I'm gonna declare that I love you. I love you more than anything else. And I am going to exercise a faith that very few reach. And I definitely have not reached and I wanna go to. So I'm gonna declare this for you. I'm giving it to you. And it was just really crazy. Now things still get out of whack sometimes. We still buy some things that we want, we don't necessarily need and we get a little behind and we're like, okay, no, but I can tell you this, in 23 and a half years of marriage, the first check I get it right every month goes to the church of celebration. And here's what's even crazier, ready? Nuts, because I haven't arrived just tithing alone. I've been able to, and I don't, it's so weird. It's like, take care of all this other stuff and give to somebody going on a missions trip. Give to another church plant. Be able to give to somebody in need. Be able to, to, to just continue giving and giving. I support my sister and brother-in-law in the Philippines. And I don't know how this is done every year. I have no clue, but at the end of the year, and I look, I don't like looking at my, give, at my, at my giving statement because I'm like, oh, the flesh in me is like, whoa, what I could have done with that. You know what I'm saying? And I have not arrived. But we're at a place in which now we actually give 17 to 20 percent of our income away. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm giving you an illustration of we have not arrived. Because I still, and I know her heart, we still want to keep giving. (laughs) 
Maybe you are getting what this pulling a cane attitude means today. Here's what I know. When I read this story, Cain is a lot like a lot of followers of Jesus today. Here's what I mean. Cain didn't treat God like a priority. He treated God like a charity. And a lot of believers in Jesus do this today. They treat God like a charity. And God, go ahead, find it in Scripture and try to prove it to me. But God is not a charity. He's not someone you just donate something to when you're done with it. Like the Goodwill or Salvation Army. He's not someone you just throw a little spare cash at because you feel a little guilty because Pastor Josh made you feel uncomfortable on Sunday. I'm telling you, it's so unfortunate today, but there are a lot of believers today that are living normal and not like an alien. And they are giving God... whatever they can get whatever they can afford whatever is left over and that's not right and you may think you're like I'm given that's never good enough for God Listen, friends, I'm almost done. Whatever you give to God, it is a direct reflection of your gratitude for God. Do you know that? And one of the single greatest things that I have learned about generosity in my own particular life is this. When I am grateful, man, I'm generous. I just want to give. When I am grateful for something, right? You are probably the same way. When you're grateful that your kids are finally doing what you've been telling them to do around the house without having to be told to do it around their house, you got no problem giving to them to fill up their gas tank or going to Dutch Brothers, which is sucking my wallet dry. I got no problem. I want to give. Because I'm grateful for my children for learning principles on serving and giving to me. When I'm grateful that someone wants to surrender their life and go and plant a church, I want to give to them financially. When I'm grateful that someone has listened to God and said, I'm going to India this year, or I'm going to Philippines, or I'm going to Africa, I am grateful that they are listening to the heart of God and responding, and I want to give to them. When you are grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for you. Oh, trust me. All you want to do is give to him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes today. I got a feeling that someone here today is struggling with what we've been talking about in this series. Or today really bothered them. They're ticked off. That's cool. And usually this is the number one thing that I get. Most people's biggest challenge is I want to be great. I want to be generous. But I just can't afford it. I can't figure it out. Stop doing the math. You're trying to figure out something that is a God equation and you're never going to be able to figure it out. You just got to, okay, I'm taking the leap of faith and I'm doing it. And you want to be generous because you're created in the image of a generous God. So we want to help you. We get that's the biggest hurdle. That's the biggest obstacle. We want to help you. So far through two weeks, 15 families have signed up for Financial Peace University, which is when we run the promos, which is awesome. I'm praying that today is the day for you to sign up for Financial Peace University. Okay? 
Financial Peace University starts two weeks after this series on March 4th, but you can sign up today. You can fill out the card inside your program. You can stop by the table as soon as you walk out and it's staring you smack dab in the face. Or you can go to your Bible app and you can sign up there. You can sign up for fi Financial Peace University. And I can tell you this, which is the coolest part about it. It's not only going to help you get your finances somewhat manageable. It's going to take a lot of time because chances are you've gotten yourself into debt over a lot of time. So don't go into it and just be overwhelmed, okay? Ginger and I took it the very first time. We're like, this is stupid. I'm never going to accomplish anything like this in 10 years. And it takes time. You got yourself into a problem over time, so it's going to take time to get you out of it. But if you dedicate yourself, the last few principles of Financial Peace University teach you about first fruits. Some of the most important things that you need to learn as a follower of Jesus Christ. Kind of like if you want all that stuff that we just learned to stay in order, start here. So today's your day to sign up and do that. Okay? Now somebody here is struggling because you realize, whew, maybe that's me. I've struggled. I've struggled. Here's what's so cool. Last week, Ginger shared this with me. I don't even know who it is. I didn't ask them permission, so it's a good thing I don't know who they are because I'm telling them their story. But a young lady posted this past week on one of our COC pages something like this, which is so cool. I love this because it's always cool when it happens during the generosity series. But it says something. I just got to share this with somebody. My husband and I have been really struggling with this whole tithing thing and doing it and taking the step of faith and going for it. I love it. And we did it last week, last week, just last week, February 4th, was our first week we tithed. And I can't even tell you, this blows my mind, but that very week we received a check in the mail for the exact same amount of what we tithed. Oh my gosh. It was like God was rewarding our ability to stretch our faith. And then you know what I love? That's not even the part that I love. The part that I love is they said this. They said, we're going to now take that money and we're going to give it to Power Pack Copa so we can feed kids through the church and through that ministry. And I'm like, how cool is that? They got the principle. When God gives you more, it's not to raise your standard of living, it's to raise your standard of giving. They're getting it. They're getting it. And you're out there. I'm not naive. I know this entire church is not going to take that step overnight, but somebody here in this series and this day and this week is ready to do it. We're going to stand, we're going to pray, and we're going to sing a song, and there's what's next counselors that would love to be here. I would start here if I were you. I would start just by saying, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry for trying to figure this out myself and not living your way and trying to keep living my way. Would you help me? Would you show me how I can give you my first and best? I would start there today. And I'm going to challenge you to come forward and do it. I'm not going to do like Ginger. She's too sweet and says, we're going to ask you to come forward. I'm going to tell you, you need to get your butt down the aisle and you need to ask God for forgiveness because things ain't going to go away until you do it. I'm telling you, I love you too much to not be straight with you. Let's all stand. I'll pray. And then the altars will be open. Jesus, we love you. Thanks for my friends. Thanks for my wife for being so loving and forgiving of me when I use her as examples. I pray, God, that this series this week and next week would move in someone's life in an amazing and miraculous way. I'm praying today that somebody would overcome their pride and say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Forgive me, God. Help me take that step of faith and move forward. I praise you in your precious and your holy son's name and all God's people said, Amen.